So I'm going to take the time to welcome you before we have our moderator take care of everything because uh, I think it's, it's the first time I come here, but she'll, she'll run the, the logistics. I would just want to frame it for you because for the next three days, people that are interested in Latino uh, youth development, both on the research and the practice side, we get together here and we get to see each other's stuff. Everybody needs to see the other stuff because we have so little. Right? And so you're making it up, you're translating other programs, you feel alone. And that has to change. So I will I will pass out a sheet for you to sign up. I'll include you in the in the Latino PYD listserv so that you can start picking up ideas. It's low traffic, for better and for worse. That is, as things get hot once in a while, especially when we get stuck with it. What is this? How do you adapt it to Spanish? Or what word do you use for this? That kind of stuff tends to get. The nitty-gritty tends to get a little bit more traffic. But anyway, so you'll get to meet everybody because we are, uh, don't feel intimidated. It just means that we want to include you. But if you ask your name 10 times, you've got to pick up some names. We're not that many. There's maybe, at least that I have on the list, about 50 people that do Latino PYD that have opted to, to sign up. There are more out there. But I estimate there's no more than 100 because uh, they've worked alone for so long, it's very hard to gather them. So whenever you see somebody, you know, invite them, give them my email or the other way around, just send me their email with, with their permission and so we can, we can join them up. We've got a lot of work to do and we're working alone and just not good enough. And related to that, uh, I don't have too many copies, but in Illinois, where I'm from, we are looking now for a specialist on basically new audiences. And it does include the Latino uh, world. Uh, no PhD required, prefer preferred, but not required. Uh, but your experience with Latinos would really help because we started that program three years ago. We're out of the pilot stage. Now it's time to massify it, and it's time to dedicate it for resources. And so anybody? wants to look at the, okay, there you go, three right there. That means that I get the last one. Okay, so uh, I guess, Manilu, you can take over now since you're, I'll be your timekeeper. Oh, oh, no, there are six people there. Six people. He knows. Do we have time to all introduce ourselves? That would be nice, Marilu. Mm -hmm. Well, Marilu. Me? Yeah. Okay. Again, Ricardo is just a nice person and he caught me and he got me to live <laughs> Yeah. So I'm Marilu Andon. I'm with University of Illinois Extension. I'm the 4-H Youth Development Educator in Cook County. Um, we are right now trying to work in uh, Juntos, getting Juntos uh, going in Cook County. So we're right now in the planning stages. And um, I'll reach out to some, I don't know if there's anyone from New York, but I know uh, Lupita is uh, also getting ready to work. Yeah, and Steven is ready. Steven here from Sonoma, and Claudia from Riverside. So we are launching that in, in six towns. Yeah, I've already reached to Elvis uh -huh. uh, because they've done it. So to my support group, mm -hmm. do I do the them or? Okay, so we'll start with you. All right. My name is Tommy. I am the 4-H Youth Development Specialist for the University of Missouri Extension uh, in Jackson County, which you know you're going to Jackson. <laughs> 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 uh, my name is Karina Kraft, and I work for IMPACT, our Missouri Parents Act. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that helps parents with special needs kids help navigate the special education process, and we also help youth with self-advocacy here in Missouri. Um, so we do that free of charge, and I'm the Spanish Latino person. I'm the only one who speaks Spanish, so I cover all Missouri. <laughs> Hi, my name is Erin. I'm a national college academic professor in Florida, and we're here as part of her research does the role of the Yeah, so she's pretty much that information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm Stephen Worker. I'm the 4-H Youth Development Advisor in California and three-county North San Francisco. So 
Hi, I'm Mary Ingram. I work for the University of Missouri Extension. I'm a human development specialist in Southeast Missouri and St. County. I've been here for well over 30 years. Is the part that I'm going to change any more is Congress Lawyer, which is the Landis Lawyer. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Yolka Gill, and I'm the 40th representative in Riverside County that is South Dakota. Hello, everyone. I'm Diane Mack, and I'm the Northeast Area Great Youth Development Specialist in for Kansas State University. So I work uh, on a regional level to help with um, extension programming and then also do some state responsibility. Good afternoon, I'm Ken Santiago. I work at Wayne City College in Chicago. Um, hi, my name is Shalita Castro, and I'm the 48th Community Humanity Cooperative Extension Program. In uh, Texas, and I work in uh, Cameron County, which is the most south of Texas you can get before you get Mexico. <laughs> 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 I'm Claudia Diaz, and I'm the Forage Youth Development Advisory in the Southern Southern Area Council. I'm Lupita Fabregas, I'm the Assistant Director for Diversity and Expansion in, the, in California. I'm Tammy Lorch, and I am with the University of Minnesota Extension. And I'm in Southeast Minnesota. I work in 18 counties. Um, and I just keep coming back because Ricardo first introduced me to the conference three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Rudy Yanni uh, Benavides. I um, used to work for the Graduate Intern for Kansas 4-H. Um, I worked as an interim project manager for 4-H. And now I work uh, for Kansas Childcare uh, Training Opportunities as a bilingual consultant and training Hey everybody, my name is Alaya Mansurdipsi. I'm the New Youth and Adult Audiences Specialist for uh, NCDC, Kansas State Research and Extension 4 H. Yeah. My name is Chicago Diaz, and I try to help our groups stick together. So as I pass this along, go ahead and just circle your name, and I'll add you to the list. So this is the attendance thing. We already have a directory. You can see everybody. But if you're not on the directory, you can add yourself to the back of the lobby. Okay. And uh, I will be timekeeper and Sam need to dominate their tech. We are recording all these sessions, so for other colleagues that didn't come, we can refer them to it. And uh, it shouldn't interfere with what, what, what we're doing in the room, but once in a while we might have to have a technical pause to make sure we're okay, <laughs> right? And Sam gets the right to call it whenever she wants. <laughs> <laughs> we missed it. We missed it. Oh, 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 yes. Yes. Hi, I'm Jamie Evans Avila. I'm with Kansas City Public Schools and our language services department on the family and community communication side. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Ava Santiago. I work with Jamie. I'm with Kansas City Public Schools. I'm a program coordinator for a program called Tlaxa Comunitaria, which is an initiative between the Mexican Consulate and Kansas City Public Schools. Mm -hmm. You are? Uh, yeah, hi, I'm uh, Brandon Ortega. I'm a student here at UKCC. And I'm a social work student at uh, the master's level from the Washington University of St. Louis. Yes, yeah, so I think we should I just introduce who they are and let's go. So our speakers for today are presenters. Claudia Bevia Tabasco. She's uh, from the University of California, the Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Via Carrasco received her BS in Food Industry Engineering for ITESN in 2012. AM in International Agriculture from Oklahoma State University in 2014 and is a Master's in Management and Marketing from University Universidad Popular Autónoma del Estado de Puebla. As a graduate assistant, she conducted research on food security and coordinated community development projects in Puebla, Mexico. As an area for a chief development advisor, Claudia's primary focus is to develop, implement, evaluate, strengthen, and expand local 4 H programming to better serve currently underrepresented populations in places including Latino and or low income youth in Riverside and some of Latino counties. Uh, Yolva Kim, she's a 4 H community education specialist in Riverside County, California. And Rudy. Rudy, 
And so they made a specific recommendation of how programs that were successful and committed according to the director was taking in consideration. So the first of that is that they were integrating a extended understanding of youth development and often that looks that is in German only focusing on the youth but it extended family. <laughs> they also they were providing supports for positive ethnic identity. Uh, they were also contending with the effects of social uh, and psychological discrimination. Most of the programs were responding to economic poverty and they also acted their they were like asset-based programs that considered the Latino community. So that's how we start our research project like having no the understanding of these findings and as I've been saying, if a qualitative research project, I'm going to briefly explain the methods, but we start doing an analysis of the community, like with particular, basically like community mapping. And something that was really critical for us is that we interviewed like key informants and it was people that have been living in the community for the long time and who provide us like an evil view of what was going on in, in where we are going to select our study sites. Then we went and interviewing them and we make like a site selection based not only on uh, sites where there was like predominantly Latino community, but we also want to have representation of urban, rural, and suburban communities. Um, and after that, we went and do organizational staff interviews, just focus groups, and then at the end, we do the case of development. So I'm happy to answer like the questions like after the presentation, so we can dive into each of the topics what the study took place. So um, to give you guys a little bit of background about where, uh, where the research was, was conducted, so we had three counties in California that were part of this, one in Northern California, um, Santa Clara County, which is mostly urban, suburban, it does have some rural areas. Uh, we also went to the San Joaquin Valley, which is Merced County. Uh, that county is particularly more rural areas um, and agricultural, so we have a lot of farm workers um, in the area. Um, and also Southern California, um, particularly in the Inland Empire, which is um, small city suburban, but also rural areas spread out throughout around the city. So they're pretty um, much, it's a huge county, so they're they're really spread out um, towards the um, Arizona border as well. So um, here's what it looks like. Uh, Santa Clara is would be the one in green. There we have Merced next to it and we have Riverside here with some of the interviews conducted and in around this area of the county. So, um, this is our study sample. So basically we went um, and interviewed, conducted 13 interviews, uh, like Claudia mentioned, with people who had the ego to be with the community, um, who were identifying organizations that were being successful at serving Latino youth. So we interviewed uh, 13 people. They noted, hey, you know what? Uh, Raices Cultura and Coachella Valley is doing a good job. Go in a few minutes. So we went, we conducted lots of interviews. Um, and um, it was a total of 15 key informants. Uh, we also conducted in interviews with the organization staff. We had focus group with the youth um, of about, you can see here, about 60, 55 youth. Actually, yeah, 50 youth. Can't count today. <laughs> so 50 to 60 youth were actually interviewed. Um, and we also interviewed 4-H um, programs in all the counties participating. We wanted to see the similarities and differences between those organizations who are successfully serving Latinos and our 4 H program. Um, so the organizations in the sample, um, we uh, selected five enrichment, um, which means that they are doing um, like after school enrichment or homework or any other type of um, educational enrichment for the youth. We chose five that are advocacy and uh, social justice. So these are these organizations are actually using ethnic identity um, curriculum to empower their students. Uh, we have we have the two um, enrichment and one stop. So organizations are doing everything for the kids, including homework help, food help, shelter help. So anything related uh, mentorship. Um, so um, and then we have one that's doing all of them together. So um, this is just to show you sort of the sample that we used, um, that was used in our research. So um, some of the characteristics of the staff from the organizations were interviewed. As you can see, the majority of the staff um, but within, within the organizations are Latino. Um, there is um, a variation on mostly the gender, uh, but most of the people we interviewed was or was intentionally um, hired 
or participate in the program to be role models for their youth. So the youth that we interviewed, um, this is important to note that uh, there was a variation of the youth that we've interviewed. Um, a lot of them were U.S. born, but we also had a few who were born in Mexico and were brought up as small children to the U.S. Um, we did have, um, the age range was about the same. A lot of these youth were first generation as well. So they were the first ones to go to school here in the U.S. Um, through all three camps. So we're going to present the findings of the first data set that we have that is organizations that are not for age, but they are doing as a culture setting what they do. And so the, for, for the concept of framework, how we define it for the study were like the guiding principles that the organizations were doing to design all these programs. And so for most of the 4-H programs that they do like learning by doing on hands on. So it's just like the, you know, the something that comes to the staff mind. So, so this is our um, California concept of programs, so of course, not all of our, not all of our staff know this by memory, but if you talk to generally across the board, they say we do things that we're doing, or we use like teams of teachers as part of our model. So, uh, so again, presenting the findings, we wanted to know what were are the underlying principles? What were these organizations taking in consideration before they started population? And this is like a summary of that. Uh, so all of them wanted to have like equitable access. Um, so someone can help me with this part? I will, thank you. We want all the students to be part of this program and to take advantage of the opportunity that's given because we never want to close the door on anyone. We always have an open door policy and so we always want to make sure that we keep our students. If it's a financial hardship, we don't want to push them away. We'll do whatever it takes to help them and you know if it means waiving their fees based on their case, then yeah, we will go ahead and work on that child for child. So this is uh, an executive director of an organization talking and as we heard with somebody in the audience, it's like, I'm the only, you know, like I'm the one that serves all these people. So it's like this mindset in the staff that provides a great access for the people. Um, this is uh, one of my favorite quotes, uh, interviews uh, that we did, I mean, I still remember. And this uh, quote is calling about a young member that was part of the program, uh, but she already, uh, you know, left the, the program. And so the staff is talking about the one-on-one -on -one relationship that they are able to be with the kids, not only in the program, but outside the program. So you want to go ahead and read it? Oh, can you help me read it? Sure. So a lot of the students that have been part of our organization and our programming have built really strong relationships with the members and the volunteers and everyone who participates in the space. Some of the earlier students, you know, they they'd they be at Berkeley and they will text us late at night and they'll be like, uh, I hate this class. My professor says something racist. I don't know if I belong here. Like those are experiences that we share when we went to school, you know. So we encourage and tell them, you know, that this is the experience. Um, but you being there is a form of resistance. Those are the conversations that can happen when you're in a nine to five job, you know? And so we've been able to continue those relationships throughout the program and outside the program. Um, so other thing that we find under organizations uh, and their framework was that they built a trust and familiarity. And so this is another quote that exemplifies that example. So we work with parents navigating the school system and knowing that you're right. And that's when it really started fitting with me. Like our greatest impact to get to the children to be successful in a school within the population we're working with, you know, people, kids that are like me, that come from similar backgrounds, you know, always the key that we should approach, right? We should provide resources and opportunities for them. But if we don't reach the parents and really impact that environment they have outside of the school and outside of community centers like ours, then there is a lot challenging. It's gonna be a lot harder for that child to be successful. So again, this is like an staff advocacy and social justice organizations, but they were doing job not only with the Richmond, but they realized that their job needed to go beyond. And so the organization become like a one-stop organization that can really go from life health services, like food pantry, uh, clothing, like any donations that can support the family. And this is also another one of my favorite, and I'm just gonna read the first part. So we find this uh, come up among the 18 organizations, how they were addressing multiple needs and they were tapping in the strength of the community. And for me, the powerful thing of this uh, uh, staff member is like, he just plan open the conversation and say like, when we asked him about what they were the needs of the youth in the community, he was like, they need all these things at once. 
all these, this, all these discussions, all these matters, what is, you know, reproductive health, whether it's accountability, showing respect, being a man of your word. And I just love this quote because when it's relevant for all of us that work in parades, so basically he was like, you just need everything. I cannot pick a curriculum and, and pretend that that's going to help the youth succeed because they need all at once. And so, uh, so they were just like embedding and picking and choosing to provide the best support they could for the kids. Other of the finding was that uh, old organizations cultivate community reciprocity. Um, and this is something, uh, it's a youth member talking about why they like and why he'd be coming back to this organization. So can someone just help me get it? Thank you. I mean, there's a lot of nice things about the organization. Free food, meet a lot of people, a bunch of community service hours. But the main reason I stay is because, well, I personally feel like there's a difference when you see other people doing it. But when you're doing something that changes, and also when you have friends that see you and look up to you and are like, that's cool, I want to do this too. It's a good feeling, knowing that what you're doing is benefiting people in the long run. So this was the organization recognizing that they, they do have this need to, to give service in their own community. And then this is another one, and that's what I'm happy that we are presenting in the same session because it talks about image identity. And I just felt so empowered uh, after participating in this program. This young uh, man talked to us in the focus group and he said, "Like, what I learned is that when you own your culture, nobody can stop you. You are like, oh yeah, I'm Mexican and I'm going to be here. I'm going to take this role or something. But if you are confused about who you are and where you come from, are your roots? You don't have that self-esteem anymore because you're not participating much." And that goes back to one of our panelists like earlier today that was like, you know, you just need to know your role in the community and own it. And so for me, like kind of one of the critical elements and one of the main things that we're working out in Riverside County, how can we support that identity development? Yeah. Finally, the organizations also build capacity to understand and address all community conditions. Uh, Arise, yeah. So they find like the biggest thing is that they are tired of being ignored and silenced. You know, we have a lot of youth oh, who yeah. are they enrich their cultures. And we have youth have been marginalized and oppressed for so long that they are tired mm -hmm. of it. So it's that needed to be responsive to the needs. Like we often have youth in our programs that say like they care like conscious. We just have like a big discussion in a fresh group not about uh, community violence. And these were like third grade kids. And so they were like, I saw this, you know, the drug dealership and whatever. So it's starting to be aware and have that. Not saying like, oh no, we don't talk about guns here. Because that's a reality that you face in their communities. So creating the safe spaces for that. And then you also is gonna talk a little bit about the program elements and there's like a specific practices in the program that is that component to make the program more accountable. Thank you. So some of the program element findings that we um, came across are uh, the first one will be being inclusive and responsive to the activities. So um, basically, as you can see in this quote, um, organizations adapt their programs to make them inclusive for the youth and the families. So the organizations are aware of their cultural differences and the literacy levels of a family within a family. So what they do is um, they make any activity inclusive to both parents and the youth. So um, we're also promoting uh, we're also promoting storytelling because we also understand the literacy of some of the families we work with. It's not you know as high. Some of them may may not be able to read or may not be confident in reading. It all it also may not be cultural, like a cultural practice for them, but storytelling telling always is, right? So it's a good assumption, but um, this is how they, how the, the, some of those programs were trying to be inclusive. Um, the second program element that we have is um, always making the activities or curriculum interest-based driven. So um, basically they would, um, the staff would design the program in response to the youth needs and wants. So, um, Actually, um, in only two of the social justice organizations, um, staff use curriculum to support ethnic identity development. So this is important to know um, that to see how those programs were ran at the organizational level, um, who were using ethnic identity development, you can see that a lot of the youth were the ones coming up with the, with the events or activities, um, and they were very engaged in them as well. So um, for number three, for 2.3, which is two, um, we have the support for academic persistence and achievement. So, um, can help me, someone help me with that one? Um, 
Thank you. Oh, but the consistency and how often we check in with our teachers, counselors, parents is on a monthly basis, but our mentors go above and beyond the monthly check-ins. The offering of resources for tutoring, identifying their specific needs, because sometimes it's not tutoring. It's just the motivation part. So we find incentives such as, such as there's a student who has an anger management problem. And so his issue, so his issue is not understanding the material, but getting past the teacher being kind of bossy in his eyes. So it's an anger thing. So the incentive is if you go to class and you don't get kicked out of class, then we pay for your boxing a month. So as you can see, uh, the organizations are recognizing some of the issues of the youth living in poverty. So they focus on giving them incentives to actually have them be engaged and participate. Uh, so we found this across the board, um, that incentives usually uh, you know, keep the youth um, around engaged and participating in the activities. Um, and this one, this is a big one for me, right? Having fun. So you want to do, uh, want to do things that that are fun for them. They don't want the adults telling them, hey, you have to read this book, you have to do this curriculum. They don't even want to come up with the activity. So um, I have a quote by one of the staff um, from the social justice specifically um, organization that says, they just, they want to have fun. So we try to be, uh, to have like the fun shows. We'll do field trips, we'll take them to, you know, like the Chicano Park or, you know, the different places in the community. So the point here is that you want to have those opportunities to do things outside of their daily lives. So they want to do different things. So that's what we, that we came across. So, um, and again, we had, um, we came across the identity development and healing. So a lot of these organizations um, provide the space for Latino youth to talk about the issues they face, racism, discrimination, um, immigration, poverty. So anything that has to do with, um, with you know, ha make, having them heal or work on those, on those issues by, you know, also giving back to their community. So um, I'll go ahead and read this one. So it says, I think one of the things that we focus on is a lot of empowerment and healing, and healing through empowerment. So I think um, when we first started, and even throughout, like we have always kept, this is a place for us to express ourselves. And that's also a way of healing. It was just like we built a lot of community and we were able to like heal and be empowered by those things. And they gave us a lot of opportunities for women to have a voice in the Eastern Coachella Valley that wasn't before, especially young women of color. So as you can see, um, this organization is really focused on um, targeting those issues and making the youth conscious about the issues that their community um, is facing. So next we're gonna go over um, the giving back, so this one's a huge one, especially for youth um, in, in those organizations. So um, they want to make sure that someone gave them those tools to be empowered. They want to make sure that after, even after they go to college or after they go and get an education, they come back to the community and get back to the community um, to empower the next generation. Um, and it's important to note that most of the programs, I would say all of the programs involve some sort of giving back to the community from the youth. And uh, that is gonna go over the recommendations. No. And so these are the some recommendations that, that, that we do for the programs. I mean, again, we just throw out a bunch of things and sometimes even for us, like, we keep going back and say like, can we practically do this in our programs? But like kind of the main thing that we have find, I mean, and I kind of speak for Riverside County, is the integrate conceptual framework findings. I'm like, some of the things is go back to support and get them to develop and recognize the diversity in the youth. So like kind of always double checking us on those assumptions. Uh, so also like, I mean, it's taking us a while and, and it is leading us on that process right now in California. So how to develop a strategies to make these guiding principles, how to operate them. I um, mean, it's the one guiding principle is equitable access, but it's like, how can we assure that people that are not able to participate um, you know, that pay a fee to participate in 4-H because we have those waivers. And so like, what we do know, I mean, most of the programs that we interview, they were free programs. So how are we gonna be competing with those? Uh, then also, we, I mean, as we are modifying our programs, some of the recommendations that we got from the studies like to pursue implementation research. And real fast, I'm gonna try to go into the model. Um, sorry, don't get dizzy, stay with me. <laughs> um, 
I guess as you see, some of the things we fit in these elements, like program elements, and then also in the conceptual framework. And that's what this diagram is set up that way. Like at the end of the day, like the five big guidance principles that I take home message is like, you know, whatever you are behind in the circle, however your program or your organization looks like now. So keeping in mind that programs that are being successful, if you want to engage different audiences, the program is how are you going to respond to their economic poverty? How can you do something to contend with psychological and social aspects of discrimination? How can you support the positive identity development? And some of the things that we're going to do in one of our conference academy this summer, actually, in Riverside, is doing healing circles. So that there is like a lot of things that those of us will develop in that healing that is not necessarily like a set curriculum that we have, but how are we providing a safe space for our youth to talk about being, uh, you know, a woman of color, like that lady that shared their work, or how is looking look in, uh, living in a trailer park. So those things uh, that oftentimes for each are overseas because there is no curriculum for that. You know, but so so how can we be responsive to those and incorporate that in our program? So that's what we have for you all that. Thank you. And now we have Rudy Yanin de la Vida. She's from Kansas State Research and Extension Youth Development. Rudy Yanez Benavides is currently the new youth and adult audiences program manager for Kansas State uh, Research and Extension Department of Boys Youth Development. In this role, she serves Kansas families and youth through culturally sensitive programming. She has facilitated cultural adaption navigator webinars, including ages and stages, cultural edition, and innovation in voluntary and help pilot multiple bilingual bicultural 4-H clubs in Southwest Kansas for underrepresented youth and families. From her time as a graduate assistant in the Kansas 4-H office, she has worked on developing culturally sensitive curriculum to ed educate professionals working with underrepresented populations. Rudy is fluent in both Spanish and English. She's a first-generation college student and as well as a first-generation Mexican-American. She recently completed her master's thesis in cultural self-identification among extension educators and cultural competence in cooperative extension. Her research interests include culturally sensitive programming development and Latino family and youth outreach. <laughs> I'll let a lot. Okay. Um, so I actually had the pleasure of working with Rudy um, over the past few years. Um, I'm a licensed uh, clinical marriage and family therapist. I specialize in multicultural and intercultural um, counseling techniques. Uh, most of my work um, was uh, working with um, migrant families in Southern California. Uh, for about nine years teaching uh, English uh, and also uh, looking at um, career development and, and ways of uh, reaching gainful employment. Uh, I'm now back at Kansas State University as a new youth and adult audiences specialist. Um, and um, that's all the professional side, but that's not really why I'm here. <laughs> um, I'm here to talk about um, my community, um, my extended family, um, what really matters to me, um, the fact that in my home uh, there are four languages that are spoken, English, Thai, French, and Spanish. But the two main languages that my son is learning is English and Spanish. Um, and my, my husband speaks Thai, so he's trying to learn Spanish. <laughs> and so I'm here um, because this is really um, what I love and um, I feel deeply connected. Um, to the Latino community in my in my area, and um, and so I'm excited to be able to speak at Columbia today. Thank you. And um, similarly, uh, this is my first time actually at Columbia, so I'm very excited, very uh, welcome here. I feel very welcome here, very connected to my community. I am from a very small, small county, the smallest county in the state of Kansas. I was born and raised there. Uh, my parents were immigrants. Uh, my dad worked in uh, feedlot in the ag industry for a long time, still does. 
And so I grew up uh, being the only Latina, any sort of you know person of color in my class. Um, I graduated with 24 you know, in small town close to here. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I was one of 24 um, graduates in my high school. And then you put on top of that, um, I was a, a dual language learner. Um, I spoke only Spanish up until I started grade school. Um, our ESL program at the time uh, was really pushing, you know, do not speak Spanish at home. It really pushed my parents to speak um, to speak me English, which they did not. Thankfully, I am <laughs> proudly bilingual today. Um, and so I, I really speak to this as well as personal connection to uh, Southwest Kansas, where, where I grew up, um, but also my heritage and the kiddos that I'm very fortunate to help um, today. So how, so how did you oh, meet, Rudy? We met. <laughs> um, it was in 2013. I became a um, intern in, um, in her office. So she was just starting out in her position at Kansas uh, State 4 H. And I was helping her on this crazy adventure um, to navigate uh, cultural differences and bringing that into exception. And what a ride it's been. <laughs> and so okay, I'm thankful for her mentorship. Um, we've had a lot of fun projects. and. I've been calling her family too now. Her child called me Tia. I'm very, very cute. It is. Oh, I it. <laughs> we want to start um, kind of fun, uh, sort of sharing with you when I first started with Extension. It was uh, a pilot program through a grant that we had. Um, if I can, okay, jinxed it. Yeah. There we go. And I have a, a, it's a short five minute video on kind of what happened that summer, what transpired. This is my first experience with Extension, FYI. I had no idea what I was doing. I just knew I wanted to work with youth in my community. And so um, I hope you enjoy it. And then we will uh, go forward. My name is Miguel Sortero. Um, I like all the experiences that I had with um, learning how to build robots. Learning how to make light out of just a little flash light and a power battery in a My name is Leslie. It's helped me entertain myself and to be a team and work together. We've done activities and talking about how we could change our life. I came to the U.S. when I was three years old. Sometimes I forget that um, Spanish was my first language. <laughs> I wasn't involved in 4-H. Um, so that's one of the things that really gets me excited about this program. So being able to do that and make that difference in families that are not usually in 4-H um, has really been a great experience. And I feel like I'm being part of something big that way. The more we can do for the, for the children, okay, that's going to lift up the whole family. Okay? And it truly will lift up these families economically. That's what's happened with every generation. We're all, we're all, we're all children, immigrants. We all aspire to be lifted up. We all try to do things to, to better our lives. And so 4-H is, is a part of that. Growing up on a dairy uh, is home to over 14,000 cows and heifers, additionally about 65 employees, uh, many from El Salvador, Guatemala, uh, and many other countries throughout Central America, South America, and up through Mexico. If you really look at the dynamics of Southwest Kansas, it, it truly is an economic empire and how it's developed and grown. And, and without the Hispanic culture and the culture of many other immigrant populations, uh, it wouldn't have been possible to do what it's done over the past four or five decades. Uh, they're very family focused and uh, uh, we think that 4-H is just a nice add-on to that to help their children have opportunities to develop. Well, we were targeting, um, you know, just non-traditional families, so families that had previously never been in 4-H or um, weren't really sure how to receive information about 4-H. And so that's kind of who we started to connect with. It's what I've always wanted to do is work with youth and to work with youth that I identify with as a bilingual, as a Hispanic American. Um, I just, I feel like, I, I hope I'm a role model to them. I think that really helped um, 
bring these kids up to their confidence and telling them, you know, these things are possible. What do you want to do? And exposing them to all our projects. They, you know, they didn't know engineers made robots or they didn't know you could cook uh, bread out of, in a bag, you know, things like that. And I think that really exposes them to things and um, hopefully things to the future. This 4 H club is more than youth development, it's family development. It's a place for parents to feel comfortable interchanging ideas. So we do everything bilingually. We do the voyage pledge in Spanish and then in English. So they can hear whatever we're talking about in both contexts. That's our motto. The entire family comes to learn together. In the summer, there were lots of activities going on in the community, but they were really unique. It was wonderful. You know, like family, we're learning every day a little bit more about 4 H. We never stop to learn. That is something that I like because every day we have something new. They, the, my girls, can do something different, and they can try different things, and that's something that I. Um, that we are really enjoying. No, you darle gracias a 4H, porque por esta oportunidad que nos están dando, y que seguir aprovechando al máximo. 4H está haciendo muy buen trabajo. Muchas gracias a eso. I want to thank 4H for that opportunity and for all that it's given us, given us the opportunity for. Once 4H caught on, the concept of 4H, that it's family, that it's education, that it's learning, it's all things that that integrate a family into a community. We can have great leaders come in out of this community just by supporting them. And when we give them the support they need, wonderful things can happen. You have families that are going back into their communities talking about the fact that uh, about how what 4-H is doing for them and their family, getting people excited. We can look back at countless stories of how our employees have grown uh, and how their children have grown and become successful members of society. Who knows what great things we're going to do. For my club, for my club, for my community, my community, my country, my country, and my world. And my world. <coughs> Attributed to the entrance that we had at the time in the language. So, uh, 
you know, unfortunately we didn't have anybody on staff uh, who could speak these other languages, but they came to the into meeting. We were able to meet them. Uh, we had some translators there. So it was a really, really um, amazing multicultural family um, that happened at that first into meeting. And so I just wanted to go ahead and share that. And so uh, the way that this was able to happen was through this grant that we had, and it was, you know, just to help um, engage some of our Latino kiddos in the area. And so it was three counties, um, and like you know, the figure said, we had a lot of kids, you know, a big waiting list waiting at the end of the summer, and so they were able to sort of start new clubs up and get those kids involved. So flash forward, um, two years later in 2015, um, we uh, had a chance through a, a reaching new audiences grant through the uh, 4-H state office to be able to hire uh, interns at a state level, bilingual and bicultural interns, and uh, since uh, Kansas State University is in the northeastern part of Kansas, um, we had uh, a uh, Latinx uh, population that was beginning to form lots of um, youth and families. And so we were able to have an intern uh, with, in northeast Kansas and a couple in southwest Kansas as well. So we began to build upon the concepts and the framework that was started in southwest Kansas and had a lot of success uh, and started to branch out. Um, we partnered with the Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation, uh, the Kansas uh, LSAM program, uh, and were able to actually get uh, bilingual bicultural interns that had a specialization in STEM, uh, and that were, uh, and, and most of them were also Spanish speaking, um, which was really exciting. Uh, and so Rudy and I started working together at that point, uh, and we developed uh, a training for the interns uh, to introduce them to the concepts of culturally responsive standard-based teaching. Uh, a lot of those concepts, they already were living every day. So for them to see uh, that they already innately knew what cultural responsive teaching looked like and that they could actually be experts as they went into these extension units and share that with other agents uh, and supervisors was exciting. Um, we, we also really wanted to begin to infuse and, and, and have people start talking about what culturally responsive pedagogy meant um, so that we could begin to train our faculty, our, our um, 4-H agents across the state of Kansas. So looking at what valuing diversity really means instead of um, encouraging people that are different to go along to get along or to assimilate into a certain cultural construct um, that can be prevalent in extension um, at times. Um, really looking at living that value, um, having the capacity for cultural self-assessment um, that, you know, uh, we are all cultural beings and the more I learn about my, the multiplicity of cultures that make up who I am, the more I'm gonna be able to reach out and understand others and be more uh, culturally responsive. Um, I think also this idea of double consciousness, I think it's really, really hard um, for some agents to understand what our uh, Latino youth go through daily because of the amazing skills that they have to uh, be able to shift in between cultures uh, so smoothly, uh, it actually makes it a lot easier on the agents. Sometimes they don't realize that the, the uh, Latino youth or Latina youth is, uh, is code switching. And so just kind of introducing really fundamental concepts related to culturally responsive pedagogy so that our agents could begin um, to learn how to make programming more welcoming, more inclusive, more equitable. Um, and the application of CRP um, was uh, really important and really crucial, and the interns were great at, at driving that example because they themselves were, by the way, they were identified with the youth that they were serving. And so a lot of it was ensuring that we weren't generalizing, like some of the earlier um, Latinos as all being Mexican. Um, so it was very important to understand that there are very unique um, Latinos, very unique Hispanics, very unique um, kiddos. And so what CRP does is it really drove us to look at each child individually and use their strengths and their cultural identity to drive what they wanted to learn, um, how they learned. Um, sometimes it was less about structure and really just going with the flow during our activities, doing our programming. Um, as we would come in with a list of things we were going to accomplish during our uh, you know, executive meeting. And at the end of the day, we were like, oh, we didn't do anything on this list. We would just kind of go with it and do, what, do you, what would you like to do today? What are you um, struggling with this week? Um, you know, a lot of kiddos 
um, I saw and kind of identified myself with as well are in the 8, 9, 10, and they're helping interpret um, for their parents um, at very, uh, very intense situations. Um, you know, maybe hospital rooms and courtrooms. Um, and it's like, is this still happening? This was me when I was eight. I thought this wasn't a thing anymore. It was still very much happening. So a lot of kids were, would come in and kind of just vent or say, I don't want to do this. Why do I have to do this? I have no idea what's going on. Um, so a lot of that is just being there for them. And I think our interns did a very good job um, at doing that. So that that's, you know, holistically, that's what looking at PRC is. I think that one of, one of the things I have struggled with most is just trying to relay that cultural knowledge and be a bridge builder between our um, Latinx families and then agents. Um, and I, I'm not ashamed to say that. I mean, there are sometimes questions that I'm asked um, about ethnic identity development and the agent doesn't really realize that that's what they're asking me. But one, one particular agent said, I don't understand why we need to say the pledge in Spanish. And that was a valid question. It wasn't said in a passive aggressive way or a sarcastic way. It was like, I don't get it. This family is bilingual. Why aren't we just saying it in English? And so to try to come at it from a perspective of sharing what um, positive ethnic identity development really is and making that into a practice that we can all embrace in Kansas was a very challenging task. Um, and so I, one of the things that emerged from um, our work together from this grant was the formation of the Riley County uh, Verde Clovers. They came up with the name, I think it's club. And, um, and so this particular club, uh, the foundation of this particular club is um, using programming that focuses on ethnic identity development uh, and culturally responsive uh, pedagogy. We have um, actually passed around a poetry book, a bilingual poetry book, that they, uh, all the youth came up with called Soy Kansas, I am Kansas, and we want to share with you um, just one activity we did together that focuses on ethnic identity development. I just see a hand. Did you, sorry, did you have a question? You're using the word agent. Oh, oh yes. 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 What, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a, um, I'm a specialist. I work at the state level, and then agents are within our county in Kansas. So there are four H agents within every county or district. Um, yes, there's staff. There's staff. Yeah, and, and it may vary state to state. I, I work all the way in that New York and Nebraska uh, weekend, so I worked in the Nebraska section, and they don't use agents, so in my case, I'm an educator. Yeah, so thank you for that question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. I am Kansas. <laughs> My name is Priscila Huero, and I am an intern for the Riley County Extension Office. I'm focusing on providing services to non-traditional 4-H families, such as the Hispanic community. My name is Minidor Lancharet. Um, I am a poet as well as a graduate intern through 4-H and off of Research and Extension. I am working on creating uh, diversity and culturally sensitive programming within 4-H, as well as bringing to light through poetry what other groups are within Kansas, particularly in Manhattan. I am from the long yellow house, clean, loud, and calm. I am Bosadas and loud. I am from gymnastics, from Chipotle and Starbucks, from tall grasslands and prairie dogs. I am from Mexico, from candy and tortas. I am from the yellow house and the mountain road. I've never heard about 4-H. The first time I heard about 4-H was here in Manhattan. And I just love the idea of providing a positive youth development What I've really loved about this project is getting to work with my cultural and bilingual youth. My background is I'm Russian and Jewish, and I grew up in a household that spoke primarily Russian, so when I had to learn English, it was a very, very, very difficult and tedious task. When I was told I would get the, the opportunity to work with bilingual youth, that really excited me um, because it brings me back to my roots, and it also helps me to show them that you know, they have a voice, even if sometimes the words aren't in English, you can have words in other languages too. 
I think one of the, if we tie this back to ethnic identity development, going from dissonance to integration, I think one of the, the, the strongest parts of, of doing this bilingual poetry project was them embracing um, their unique heritage of being able to say proudly, I'm Kansan and I am Mexican, or I am Mexican American, or I am Latino or Latina. And I can actually, both of these identities can exist within me. Um, and when I speak Spanish, I don't need to, um, I don't need to uh, whisper anymore. I can speak Spanish and, uh, and be able to speak in the same way I'm speaking in English with the same tone. So we actually had them uh, do a, uh, a bilingual poetry reading at the library and had people from the community come. It was, it was very special. Um, they all stood up together um, collectively uh, and shared their poetry instead of one person growing up at a time. I love that. <laughs> and, um, and as soon as they did it, we realized that they had never been asked to write in both languages in, in that type of setting before. And as soon as, as, as we realized that, they said, can we do it again? When can we do this again? And so that was a very um, a special moment. Um, and just going in back in to um, reiterate uh, the importance of having, um, you know, maybe college students or older uh, mentors, not just college students, Older mentors in the community who you can identify with, particularly when discussing this, you know, dual culture and the existence of both. Um, so that is really when they begin to foster their own identity and, and you know, thinking about what age they are now at the time that we are, um, you know, they are uh, being, they're seeing all these things around them. Um, they're very easy to um, sort of, they're already exploring, they're already asking a lot of questions. And so a lot of that is being built into their identity. And so ensuring that we have um, people there that can really support them is really crucial as well. Um, and then, um, and so we want to talk a little bit more about the Bird Clovers, um, just because they're kind of a set club's kind of our baby right now. <laughs> and there's a lot of changes, a lot of really good um, uh, evolution happening um, every day. And want to talk a little bit about what's going on. There. So, we, um, this, this process has been transformative for me because I started off as an extension specialist, New Youth and Adult Audiences, a couple years ago with this club when it was started. And then I became a lead volunteer with Rudy. And then Rudy went off to finish um, her dream, and I continued. And then I became a mentor uh, through um, the uh, Youth Futures program, uh, where we have just recently received a grant. And, um, and so, you know, this could not be possible, having this type of community engagement and providing services to youth and families without all of these community partners. Um, it is incredible the amount of community members that have, uh, you know, first generation uh, college students, the Boys and Girls Club, uh, the College of Engineering at K-State, LSAMP, CAUSE, um, the Kansas Association for Women in Science and Engineering, the Manhattan Breakfast Optimist Club gave us um, a scholarship to help. Um, Office of International Programs gave us English books uh, because we just recently, this Monday, um, had our first English Spanish immersion program um, open to the community where our parents, our um, Spanish speaking parents, actually taught some of the class uh, and also English speaking community members. I was like, how is this happening? Like a completely bilingual. I have never, I've, I've taught English as a second language. I have never seen a class happen the first time where it was a completely bilingual class. Immersion, English and Spanish from the beginning till the end. It was really fun. This came out of the Verde Clovers and parents saying, gosh, I'd really like to learn some more in English. And then some community members said, I'd really like to learn some more Spanish. Um, and so our first, our, and what was really exciting is the youth took a leadership role. And I was not expecting that to happen. The youth ended up showing up with their parents, the Verde Clovers youth, and they helped lead the class. Um, they helped translate, they talked to, because they were the, they were the ones that had the most skills of anybody there. <laughs> well, Rudy, you have skills too. I, 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 don't, I cannot say I have the most skills in that group. So, um, so you know, the, all of these community partners have, have created a huge impact within the Verde Clovers community. Um, we have bilingual volunteer leaders that are in STEM. We have this English-Spanish immersion program. Um, we always provide a meal for our families and youth. 
um, that's a big thing. And then there are also educational opportunities, field trips, camps, college, college readiness, um, job assistance for the parents. Um, we are a one-stop shop, and we um, <laughs> and it works. We got it works. Yeah. <laughs> it works. <laughs> So uh, and this list is not all complete. No, it keeps growing every day. Um, we build new connections. We have people calling in and say, "Why haven't you invited us to your meeting?" Like, they get really mad and they're like, "Sorry, like you are invited. Um, come over. We have food." Um, and so, um, really, this has been kind of a, a family thing because it speaks a lot to the culture as well. So it's a very family created. It's a village. It's a village. It takes a village. So I think these kids have a lot of really good role models. So this might not seem like the end of the presentation, but we did this on purpose because um, our, our club and our uh, framework is constantly evolving and changing and growing like every week. Um, so um, community partnerships really do lead to innovation and we're just kind of hanging on for the ride now. The community is driving this, so we're just kind of running behind the bus like trying to catch up. <laughs> Very much so. Um, and earlier it's very nice to sort of have the connection with these kids um, especially seeing a lot of the things that uh, they're going through uh, and things that I went through as well so um, I see a lot of uh, pride in them now a lot of confidence um, at our class as well a lot of kiddos spoke very confidently in both of their languages um, no longer wanting to whisper or needing to whisper as they're very very proud to stand up for their culture so we all must be doing something right so I'm very thankful for that so yes <laughs> I have a question. Um, once you got your group going, then they came, kept coming back and coming back. So how did you get them in there in the first place? <laughs> well, Priscilla Aguero, who was on the second video, um, was an intern and was very highly connected to the community, as was Rudy. Um, and so uh, Priscilla would do home visits. Um, both Rudy and Priscilla um, would attend mass on Sundays. Um, I think the home visits helped a lot. Um, the meal helped a lot. The transportation um, helped, support helped a lot. Uh, and the personal invitation, every single time up to today, we're always calling with the name for. <laughs> Um, the, uh, <laughs> the, the um, explanation that we were going to engage the whole family, so mom and dad bring the kids. Um, it wasn't just drop off the kids and come in. Once it was, we very much reiterated that it was the whole family. And 4-H meaning a roadmap to high school and beyond. A lot of our kids are first generation high school students. Mm -hmm. So we don't even, sometimes we can't even talk about first generation college students. We just need to talk about how we can get through high school. Mm -hmm. um, and so making that connection to furthering, being more successful academically, uh, get, you know, getting a high school diploma, going beyond that to technical school or college or whatever, um, that is a big part of our, um, our marketing. Mm -hmm. okay. I have a question. Can I? Okay. Hey, how, we have a, like a little bit of talking about how important it is to have bilingual extension agents or one in one people there is a lot of push that you don't have to speak spanish you can go and reach a community what is your first section about that? personally uh -huh. um personally and, and my my thesis was on this as well is a lot of them also the misconception was we translated documents that should be enough um and it's a really good step in the right direction don't get me wrong but i think that we have to go beyond that and and show um uh, you know, represent the population we want to serve in our hiring process. And so make sure that there are um, extension educators slash agents, um, staff members in, in positions of power, anybody in the community that we can uh, make sure and bring um, that represent the community that we're trying to help. Um, because then the trust, the relationship building is that much faster when you have somebody in your organization um, that can reach out to, to these families. Yeah, I think it's, a, that's a really, Great question. Um, I have vacillated. I, I wanted to feel, I wanted to be ideal, an idealist about this, but I, I have to say right now that I think it's going to be really hard to reach the families if there is not the language component. I, I mean, I just, I do. I, I think um, it's, there, it is such a steep learning curve because it's not the language, it's the culture. And how do we access the culture? 
going to speak the language. And, and, and so uh, if I didn't understand, if I couldn't follow, if I couldn't at least get, get by, um, I think I would be missing a critical component because, because when we speak, when we speak in one language um, that is not our native language, we can easily filter. We can filter to code switch. You know, code switching doesn't happen as easily if you're just listening to the person in their native language. And, and so it's not as authentic, I don't think. So I would lean towards hiring people that have that capacity linguistically and culturally. I don't know if that is possible um, because our hiring practices systemically are not in place and extension to do that. Um, but I think we're really missing the boat with a huge disservice. So I don't know if that's the culture or the uh, politically correct answer. I don't I don't need a political answer. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay good. That's, that's fine. That would seem a little uneasy talking about that we really should have somebody who is bilingual. So I mean, I'm, so when you say it, like, so when you were asked the question, you were kind of kind of a little tiptoeing around it, right? And for me, if somebody asks me that question, you cannot connect with the community that doesn't speak English if you do not have a bilingual person. Um, and so when you said, like, ideally, you would want someone bilingual, um, I, I guess I'm, ha I'm having a hard time understanding why your stance wouldn't be, you need somebody bilingual to go into the community to recruit, because how could you if you didn't have oh, somebody? Oh, okay, I can, I can yeah. respond to that. But yeah. This is not easy to talk about. I'm still in this position. So. Yeah. I don't think the system's set up for, for that. I, I think that people that um, do not follow that kind of traditional extension route, I don't. Uh, I just I think that it's 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 not always as inclusive or welcoming as it needs to be long term to keep people that have those skill those cultural skills. So I yeah I, I can tell you in Illinois I I did set a non variable bilingual bicultural and everyone interpreted as racial preference mm -hmm. around it. I was so happy when I had two Anglo's apply. And when I tested them, they were bilingual and bicultural. But racial preference as in? Racial, like I'm excluding Anglos. Oh yeah, but I'm saying like for specific, like a specific position where you're going to do community outreach to reach Latino families in a rural area, how would you not, like, how would you- You don't have to be Latino. This is what I'm, I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And the practice could bear it out. But when when people heard that I was not hiring bilingual bicultural, they thought that I meant I'm hiring only Latinos. Mm. Like when you went and you did community, you went you went to church, right? Mm -hmm. To a church in Spanish. Mm -hmm. So if she didn't know Spanish, uh, why would she go to the church? Because I think I understand what you know. I just feel like sometimes because everybody tiptoes around. Hey, I don't know if we should say that. You know, you couldn't do what you did. He didn't speak Spanish. You could do a lot of other things, but you would not be able, how, how do you reach a family, a mom who doesn't speak English and gain trust with her if you don't speak Spanish? And you know what I'm saying? So it's not that you can't have it, but you have to have it to have success because how can you reach a non-English speaking family if you do not speak their language? No, and that's the practical yeah. side of it. I think, yeah. I think that when a system is still primarily assimilationist, then there needs to be a lot of allies for that person. If not, they're not going to survive it. It's too stressful to, to try to have to, you know, speak acculturation and live assimilation. Um, I think we have a long ways to go in terms of allyship um, to be able to welcome. Um, yeah. I'll just pay back on what people were saying. So I'll, I'm relatively new to Extension, I'm going two years, but for me being here, Extension is not the most pure. Yeah. The beginning of Extension was more mostly agricultural and rural, and that's what it's up to be. So we're not at that point yet, where it's expectation mm -hmm. to make a statement like that and be okay and accepted by everyone. So we're just not there. So, and I will then say, like, that's discouraging for me. I mean, I don't know about you, not bilingual. Ricardo keeps encouraging me, you know, just go and do do your best. Um, and there's a 
trailer park community in a town that has a high Latino population that I just went to two weeks ago. I had another staff member who invited me. He does financial literacy all in Spanish for families. Um, and we talked about like, this is what 4-H is. Would you like me to come? But now it's like, okay, <laughs> is that a final effort? I, I, I had one community in which I had two people to hire. My cultural informants from the town uh, both told me, choose the town, don't choose the, the, the bilingual. Well, that's and when I went back to the office, they told me, no, we want to hire the local girl that speaks both languages. And it was very hard for me to then, because the local office hires, I made the recommendations and whatever else, and they, and they insisted. The girl left very fast. The people in the community that were not monolingual in Spanish, but they had a little bit, they sprinkled English, uh, they were comfortable with her. Uh, was she bilingual? No, she spoke so little Spanish. I sat in her living room and she, I, I tried to test her Spanish. She had very, you know, five words. And then, but she, and she, but she made, she went to people's houses, she ate with them, and they kind of communicated in every way. She was already working in the school and serving as a bridge to the family. They loved her. So it's not impossible, is what I'm saying. I've seen it, and it can work. It's just that the 100% experience, the ideal, darn it, yeah, it, well, it helps a lot. Well, yeah, because, well, so my position, right, so I have an initiative, I did the initiative with the Mexican consulate in Kansas City Public Schools, okay? So how, I wouldn't be able to do my job if I didn't, speak the language, right? So I'm not saying it's impossible, but what I'm saying is that sometimes at this point where we are now, okay, mm -hmm. I think it's okay to say, you know, not so much bilingual preferred. I mean, bilingual, I don't know, what, I don't know where it, the, the middle is between preferred and mandatory, you know, mm -hmm. because if you want your program to be successful and your target audience is Latinos who don't speak a lot of English, then you will be most successful if you have a bilingual person because it, it's just about the communication. How would you speak to somebody and explain it if you don't speak their language or any other language or Russian or whatever? Well, I mean, um, I completely agree. I mean, I guess I was in Spanish in school, but I have practiced it, so you know, I've been there somewhere, but I'm not prevalent. But when I was student taught, I taught at an immersion school and so going through those experiences and my only avenue was to go through with children mm -hmm. because I had enough Spanish and they had enough English that we could get it to then communicate with the parents, which is a divide and that makes it harder. Mm -hmm. But I think in like your situation, it's not an all or nothing. I mean, is there is there a high schooler or an intern or somebody else that has the language that then becomes your teammate? Because you have the knowledge, you have the enthusiasm, you're part of the community, they have the language, and then maybe you can put it together. And I don't think it has to be that the staff member necessarily has that, but somebody has to, because otherwise, you're communicating through everybody else. I think, though, in that case, I think it's possible. I mean, but I think that if that person isn't bilingual or they're not Latinx, then they need to really be deeply aware of their own. Right. And I think their own cultural and privilege and how they're navigating. And that, yeah, and I just, I mean, I just want to go back to Tammy and overall that, that we're missing this one. Like, yes, the language, I mean, might be like something that facilitates or might be about here. But along the presentation, they mentioned things to be able to serve the Latino community, like fast food, you know, like sandwiches, like green meals, like kind of at the end of the day, it's all those elements that make the program successful. And so, and it, it brings also the power of finding that allyship in the community. I'm not bilingual, but I know that at all times I'm going to have some. And I have seen it every time in our school district, like our ESL um, coordinator of San Bernardino County, which one of the ESL counties, like she's a total Anglo, like perfectly bilingual, and she has been able to bridge the cultural gap. They are giving like special recognition to the kids that sort of find proficiency, like in the first half of the nation, and they have like, you know, like, like, a, like an extra D in your certificate because you are like an English learner. And it's just like about the power of partnership and then we can have it on the phone side, we're going to try to email, we're going to try to transportation. If you the staff is not able to identify the logistical model, like the program is not going to happen. Mm -hmm.
And it's also, I mean, that, sorry, I just, the reason I was like, question, like, how long does it take you guys to travel to your daughter? Because, I mean, from my perspective, that doesn't work out like two, three, five years, you know, building on top of the kids are able to have the community library. It's like a building on top of like a nice one. We started with 10, about 10, and we have about 75 people that come now in our 2000, I want to say 15. Um, yeah, 2015. So we're a couple, two and a half years into it. Um, so we're really pleased with the outcome. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Right. 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 Right.